Thank you. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. And you probably noticed the, the title of my sermon. It's the key in the nuclear briefcase. This is just a regular briefcase. How many of you are aware of the fact that there is such a thing as a nuclear briefcase? There is. And every time the president moves around, there's somebody that's going with him that carries the nuclear briefcase. There are 10 countries now that have nuclear weapons. Despite the significant progress in reducing nuclear weapons, the world's combined inventory of warheads remains at an uncomfortably high level. Toward the late 1980s, the world reached its peak, numbering about 64,000 in modern times, nine countries. Roughly 12,700 nuclear warheads. As of 2022, about 12,700 nuclear warheads are still estimated to be in use. Here's the nine nations, Russia, 4,477, 4, United States, 3,708, France, 290, China, 350, United Kingdom, 180, Israel, 90, Pakistan, 165, India, 160, North Korea, 20, total of 9440 in the nuclear stockpile that we know about. I wasn't really aware of the nuclear briefcase until just recently I began reading about it. And uh, this is what I found I'm sharing with you. Sometimes it's referred to as the football. There are four things in the football. The black book containing the retaliatory options, a book listing classified site locations, a manila folder with eight or ten pages stapled together giving the descriptions of procedures for the emergency broadcast system, and a three by five inch card with authentication codes. The black book was about nine by twelve inches. Had about 75 loose leaf pages printed in black and white. The book was classified. Site locations was about the same size as the black book, and it was black. It contained information on sites around the country where the president could be taken in an emergency. If the U.S. president, who is the commander in chief of the armed forces, decides to order the use of nuclear weapons, he or she would be taken aside by the football carrier and the briefcase would be opened. A command signal or watch alert would then be issued to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The President would then review the attack options with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and decide on a plan which could range from the launch of a single cruise missile to that of multiple ICBMs. These are among the preset war plans developed under the O plan, formerly the single integrated operational plan. Then using MILSTAR, the aide, a military officer would contact the National Military Command Center and NORAD to determine the scope of the preemptive nuclear strike and prepare a second strike. Where two-person verification procedures to be executed following this, the codes would be entered into a permissive action link. Before the order can be processed by the military, the president must be positively identified using a special code issued on a plastic car nicknamed the Biscuit. The United States has a two-man rule in place at nuclear launch facilities, and while only the president can order the release of nuclear weapons, 
The order must be verified by the Secretary of Defense to be an authentic order given by the President. There is a hierarchy of succession in the event the President is killed by an attack. This verification process is only to ensure that the order came from the actual President. The Secretary of Defense has no veto power and must comply with the President's order. Once all the codes have been verified, the President may direct the use of nuclear weapons through an executive order via the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the combat commanders and ultimately to the forces of the field exercising direct control of the weapons. It has been argued that the President has almost sole authority to initiate a nuclear attack because the Secretary of Defense is required to verify the order but cannot veto it. However, the President's authority as Commander-in-Chief is not unlimited. U.S. law dictates that the attack must be lawful, that the military officer is required to refuse to exec ex execute unlawful orders such as those that violate the laws of armed conflict. Therefore, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and other service members in the chain of command must refuse to issue the exec and execute the order if such an order is unlawful. The football is carried by one of the rotating presidential military aides, one from each of the six armed forces, whose work schedule is described by a top secret rotation. This person is a commissioned officer in the US military. These officers are required to keep the football ready accessible to the president at all times. Consequently, the aide, football in hand, is always either standing or walking near the president, including right in an Air Force One, Marine One, or the presidential motorcade with the president. It is a nuclear briefcase with the key to unlock Armageddon. You've probably been following the news and noticed that that war in Ukraine is still going on. You remember it wasn't too long ago that Putin was threatening nuclear warfare. Everybody was on high alert. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians and the third chapter. Well, I want to begin with verse chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 3 of the book of Ephesians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. What's the next three words? with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Can you say amen to that? Amen. The blessings are available for those who chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Then over here in chapter 3, we had our scripture reading. Chapter 3 and verse 14, for this reason, Paul is saying, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives this name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to the power that's worked within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew in the third chapter. Matthew chapter 3, and you know, it's interesting when you compare scripture with scripture, different things come to light. 
Have you noticed, have you been reading a particular chapter, either in the Gospels or in one of the Old Testaments? You've read it many times, and all of a sudden, something jumps out at you. You read it many times, but all of a sudden, truth just kind of jumps out at you. Well, here in the Gospel of John, the third chapter, we read about the baptism of Jesus. Matthew, the third chapter, and verse 13, then, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John determined tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. I want you to notice verses 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now I want you to notice how we have a little insight in the Gospel of Luke. I'm talking about this same experience. Luke chapter 3. How many have your Bibles today? Bring your Bibles. Luke chapter 3 and verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized. And notice what this says. And as he was what? As he was praying. As he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The key in the nuclear briefcase unlocked all kinds of possibilities. It incidentally, most of the people that have nuclear weapons have this nuclear briefcase. Reading from one of my favorite authors, Ellen White, in one of my favorite books, Steps to Christ, listen carefully. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. I want that to sink in. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin. And it is because they do not make use of the privileges that God has given them in the divine appointment of prayer. Let me remind you, every Wednesday night, we have a good time on the phone. It's called the Hour of Power. If you have a phone, that's all you need is to dial in. Every Wednesday night, one hour. Hour of Power. And Ellen White continues this. She says, and it's because they do not make use of the privilege of prayer that God has given them in the divine appointment of prayer. Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray? Listen to this. When prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse, there's a key in the nuclear briefcase. But Ellen White reminds us that the key in the hand of faith is prayer to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. Without unceasing prayer and diligent watching, we are in danger of growing careless and deviating from the right path. The adversary seeks continually to obstruct the way to the mercy seat that we may not by earnest supplication and faith obtain grace and power to resist temptation. Prayer. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith. One of my 
prayer goals for this church is that it will become, it's becoming, but it will become a praying church. What do you say? Turn with me the Gospel of Matthew in the 10th chapter. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus sends out the 12. Jesus called his 12 disciples to them and gave them authority. What did he give them? Authority. Power. To drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And it lists the disciples. Verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or in any town of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the workers worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there and for some worthy person. Stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is, is deserving, let the peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town. Shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. He gave those 12 disciples authority and power. And that authority and power has been conferred on his followers and disciples ever since. And Ellen White says faith is the key. Prayer is the key that opens up the stockhold and all the treasures of heaven. Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse? where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. Without unceasing prayer and diligent watching, we are in danger of growing careless and deviating from the right path. The adversary seeks continually to obstruct the way to the mercy seat that we may, may not by earnest supplication and faith obtain grace and power to resist temptation. I was glad that Judy and Jay had the courage to come forward and make a declaration for Jesus, weren't you? There are others here that have indicated a desire to follow Jesus. Some were preparing for baptism, taking the appropriate steps. One of my favorite authors is E.M. Bounds. How many have ever read anything by E.M. Bounds? No, I see just a few hands. Powerful writer of the past. And I'm quoting from one of his books. The space occupied by prayer on the Sermon on the Mount, the space occupied by prayer on the Sermon on the Mount speaks of its estimate by Christ and the importance it holds in his system. Many important principles are discussed in a verse or two. The sermon consists of 111 verses. How many? 111. 18 are about prayer directly and others indirectly. Still reading. With Moses, the great features of prayer are prominent. He never beats the air nor fights a sham battle. The most serious and strenuous life was prayer. He is as much at it with the earnestness of his soul. 
intimate as he was with God, his intimacy did not abate him the necessity of prayer. This intimacy only brought clearer insight into the nature and the necessity of prayer and led him to see greater obligations to pray and discover the larger results of praying. In reviewing one of the crises through which Israel passed, when the very existence of the nation was in peril, he writes, I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Continuing reading here, wonderful praying and wonderful results. Moses knew how to do wonderful praying. God knew how to give wonderful results. Prayer by God's very oath is put in the very stones of God foundation as eternal as its companion and men shall pray for him continually. This is the eternal condition which advances his cause and makes it powerfully aggressive. Men are to always pray for it. Its strength, beauty, and aggression lie in their prayers. Its power lies simply in its ability to pray for my people, for my house shall be called what? A house of prayer for all people. It's based on prayer and carried on in my name in the same means. We repeat and reiterate, prayer is not a mere habit riveted by custom and memory, something which must be gone through with. It's a loo depending upon the decency and performance. Prayer is not a duty which must be performed. Prayer is not a mere privilege, a sacred indulgence. Prayer is a solemn service due to God. An adoration, a worship an approach to God for some request, the presenting of some desire, the expression of some need to him who supplies all needs and who satisfies all desires, who as the Father finds his greatest pleasure in relieving wants and granting the desires of his children. Prayer is the seeking of God's great and greatest good, which will not come if we do not pray. Turning back to Ephesians. Ephesians, the third chapter. One of the most powerful scriptures, one of the most powerful promises from my perspective in all the Bible is here in Ephesians, the third chapter. Does anybody have a promise underlined in Ephesians 3? Oh, many of you have new Bibles, I see. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. If it's not underlined, it should be. Now to him who is what? What is he? He's able. But I want you to notice what he's able to do. This is our God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, I don't know how you can use any English language make it more clear. Our God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's worked within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout the generations forever and ever. And one of my, one of my favorite books of Ellen White's, and there, there, it's, it's difficult to say one over the other. I, uh, you know, when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, I was going to Pacific Union College, and I came out of the Catholic Church, as many of you know, and when I came into the church, I learned just a little bit about Ellen White. And I thought, well, you know, the Catholic Church had their saints, and Adventist Church has theirs. You know what convinced me of the veracity of Ellen White? Ellen White. Reading her writings. As counsel for my own soul, not to give to somebody else. And when I was going to Pacific Union College, I was a brand new Adventist, and I had a brand new Conflict of the Age series. How many have that series? Those of you who don't, it's a good purchase for you. Conflict of the Age series. We just sent a copy of, for my son up in Montana. He's 
one of the elders there, and they're calling on him to preach quite a bit. And we, we just sent him the Conflict of the Age series. But it's a, they're powerful, powerful series. But the little book, Education, is one of my favorites also. And there's a chapter in here in the book, Education, called Faith and Prayer. She says this, Through faith in Christ, every deficiency of character may be supplied. Every defilement cleansed. Every fault corrected. Every excellence developed. How many here have deficiency of character? Don't, wives, don't elbow your husband. Every deficiency of character. Every defilement. How many have defilements? Every fault. How many have faults? Every excellence developed. And she quotes Colossians. You are complete in him. Prayer and faith are closely allied and they need to be studied together. In the prayer of faith, there's the divine science. It's the science that everyone who would make his life works and success must understand. Christ says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. He makes it plain that our asking must be according to God's will. We must ask for the things that he's promised and whatever we receive must be used in doing his will. The conditions met, the promise is unequivocal. For the pardon of sin, for the Holy Spirit, for a Christ-like temper, for wisdom and strength to do his work, for any gift he has promised, we may ask. Now notice this. We may ask. Then we are to believe that we receive and return thanks to God that we have received. We need look for no outward evidence, she says, of the blessing. The gift is in the promise. And we may go about our work assured that what God has promised, he is able to perform and that the gift which we already possess will be realized when we need it most. To live thus by the word of God means the surrender to him of the whole life. There will be felt a continual sense of prayer, of need and dependence, a drawing out of the heart of God. Prayer is a necessity, for it's the life of the soul. Family prayer, public prayer have their place, but it's secret communion with God that sustains the soul life. I think many of you know that Karen and I have been on a prayer line now with a number of other people across North America every morning at 7 o'clock, except on Sabbath, it's at uh, 3 o'clock our time. And uh, we've been on there for a number of days now. And it's just absolutely amazing to hear and to witness and to watch the answers to prayer. We serve a God answering prayer. What do you say? A God who answers prayer. But he's waiting for us. Just waiting for us. And what's so amazing, and Ellen White makes it very, very clear that the gift is in the promise. When we claim the promise, we already have the answer. We are to go about our work realizing that we will realize it when we, we will realize it when we need it most. Reading it again, closing, from the book Steps to Christ. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin, and it's all because they do not make use of the privileges that God has given them in the divine appointment of prayer. Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where treasure the boundless resources of omnipotence? Without unceasing prayer and diligent watching, we are in danger of growing careless and deviating from the right path. The adversary seeks continually to obstruct the way to the mercy seat that we may not by earnest supplication and faith obtain grace and power. There's nothing that Satan fears more than a praying church. There's nothing that Satan fears more than a praying person. A praying person can do what God does because a praying person depends upon God to do it. 
And I'm praying that our church here will continue to experience personally and corporately a deeper and richer prayer life. We've seen some wonderful things happening here in the last several months. New people coming every week. Visitors are coming. Can you say amen? amen? We have visitors here this morning. Let me tell you, if you didn't know it, nobody comes to this church by accident. We're glad you're here. We want you to be a part of this body. We believe that Jesus is coming soon and it's so important to help people get ready to meet him. Can you say amen? amen? Prayer is the key in the hand of faith. I don't care what all those people have in their nuclear briefcase. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith. Father, we pause a moment here this morning and again so thankful for the privilege of prayer. To know that we serve a God that not only hears but answers our prayers. Not because we're worthy, but because you're worthy. Thank you, Father, for this privilege. Realizing that prayer is the key to unlock all the resources of heaven. I, Father, I pray, you know, as I've been praying privately, I continue to pray that this church will become known as a powerful praying church where miracles are taking place because you're in our midst. Thank you, Father, for what you've been doing in the past. And we're anxiously waiting to see what you'll do in the future because you have promised then we come to you in the wonderful, the powerful, the lovely name of Jesus that you will hear and you will answer. So this morning I pray for each one in the congregation, each of those that are watching online. Father, help us to intentionally spend more time in prayer with you. Thank you for loving us. Dismiss us now with your blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.